Um, my name is Tom Brolsma. I'm with the International Plant Nutrition Institute, and for the last two years, I guess, I've been asked to uh, specialize in phosphorus. I lead the phosphorus management, phosphorus program of IPNI, which didn't exist be two, more than two years ago. Um, my uh, three panelists today are uh, Carl Wyant from the Helena um, Chem Chemical Company on, the, on my far left there. Uh, Galen Musso from uh, GR Simplot and uh, Chris Piot from DC Water. And our intent here was to look at uh, the focus on what is the right source, what are growers particularly looking for in a source that will address their needs for phosphorus. So um, the specific things we'll be looking at here um, Carl will be talking about the ag retail sector, delivery of mineral and organic sources, and what drives grower choices. Uh, Galen, a little bit more from a perspective of manufacturing, wholesale, and distribution. And then Chris, uh, uh, spe specifically focusing on wastewater treatment, sustainable end use of those materials, and the phosphorus availability in biosolids. I only want to say a few words from my, my own perspective here. I think one of them is, is that I've really enjoyed my uh, two years so far in, the, in this uh, phosphorus domain. Um, I've been introduced to a bigger world than I knew existed before. Um, we, in, as Jim mentioned, this 4R system is our crop nutrition industry's approach or perspective on the bigger thing of sustainability. And I've come to realize that you know, sustainability is one thing. Phosphorus sustainability is one subset of that, and a sphere within the sphere of sustainability. And then there's agricultural sustainability, and then there's within agricultural sustainability, I think, is crop nutrition sustainability. The one thing that they do have in common is that they drive us toward common end goals of a shared uh, future that's beneficial and economically, and environmentally, and socially for all the stakeholders involved. And so, so it necessarily drives us towards collaboration. I learned some collaboration with Donna Cordell, in fact, when uh, we were playing ping pong together in Arizona. And I kept losing to her because of the fact that I wasn't a very collaborative player. I have this tendency to try to slam, and I usually miss. So anyway. So you don't, you don't even have to ask who won the game. Uh, when, it, when we look at things from a crop nutrition perspective, we recognize that any sustainability system, what we have to do as an industry is report to the public our outcomes. And we do that by measuring metrics. We're, uh, we're still developing and working metrics. When we talk about 4R nutrient stewardship in general, I have a list of nine that I show. For phosphorus, I think I can narrow it down to four that are relevant at the farm scale. If you listen to Mike Weintraub's talk this morning, he listed another important one, which I, I haven't got my head around yet to get to the farm scale, and that's biodiversity. But I believe that if we make progress on what stakeholders want in terms of farmland productivity, crop yield, crop quality, and all that, uh, soil health, including soil fertility, but also all the dimensions of soil health, Nutrient use efficiency, which uh, if, if we make progress on that, we're dealing with the, the finite nature of phosphate reserves and, uh, and the imperative to recycle. And then uh, separately, uh, water quality yet, because I, I think each of these are essential. We can focus on the first three and presume that our effects are good on water quality, but I think there are also very specific timing and placement effects that can be very important to water quality as well, as was illustrated this morning. So I want to just look at one of the metrics that we put out as an institute, which annual, every five years or so, our institute does a summary of the soil test levels of North America. And this figure represents, with four different colors, uh, four different surveys conducted since 2001. And you can see what's happening. I've, I've simplified this and grossly oversimplified it into four different categories. The 0 to 15, the 16 to 30, the 31 to 50, and the, the 50, uh, the above 50. And this is aggregated across all of North America, across all crops. And we know that different crops have different needs for different optimums, 
but I'm making as a gross approximation that for most crops, this is the level we want. This is what we consider a bit suboptimal because we're saying that basically to get a decent crop yield here, you have to be fertilizing and you have to be fertilizing at the right rate and the right time and it's absolutely critical or you will lose wheat yield. Here you're relying on what you've built up in the soil a bit more and you're only fertilizing to maintain. Here you can begin drawing down and in fact I had some reminders built in there. And then the very high category, it's only very special crops like perhaps potatoes and some specialty crops that might actually need NEP at all. You can really question that. The soil test can tell us a lot about what forms what uh, uh, a grower would need to be looking for. If it's the build category and you need a lot of phosphorus, cost is probably the biggest consideration, but you need to be able to deliver it to those soils. The geographic distribution of these soils it, it varies as well, but almost every state and every province has some in each of these four categories. So as you listen to the three uh, gentlemen who will be speaking in this panel, uh, just keep in mind that there are these different ranges of soil test and the different products that they have to offer address, uh, you know, uh, soils uh, that, are, that are testing at different levels. So, uh, without further ado, I think I will turn it over to Carl. <coughs> you want me to jump up there? Yes, yeah, yeah. whatever you feel most comfortable with. <coughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Carl Wyant. I'm, a, I'm an agronomist. And as some of you are probably Googling, what's an agronomist? My mom asked me the same question when I took the job. Um, <laughs> It's an agricultural scientist, and what I do for Helena Chemical is I take the data streams that I have available to me, water quality, water quantity, soil data, plant tissue data, and I analyze them in a way that we can take that particular crop that we're trying to grow and optimize the inputs. So what's going into that crop to produce consistent high yields and consistent quality that's demanded in the marketplace. So lots of data streams, lots of data analysis, uh, lots of you know 7 a.m. visits, you know at the field, sitting on the out of a pickup truck, talking about soil data. It's a good job. So I, I mainly cover California and Arizona, and if you really want to come out there, you know, we have the four H's: crop-wise, high input, high quality, high yield, and high value. So we, we use a lot of fertilizer and a lot of other amendments to get to where we need to go. So we use different phosphate products, and Galen will talk about this later as a part of the Simplot presentation. We use phosphorus across many types of forms, liquid, dry, to meet the nutrient demands of the crop. So liquid, you have some questions about ortho versus polyphosphate. How available is the phosphorus ion to plants and at what time frame? Uh, potatoes are very different, say, from a, a citrus crop. You have dry fertilizers. Uh, we mainly use MAP, also called MAP, but there's, you know, DAP, SSP, triple superphosphate. Just depends on where, you're, where you are and what products you have available to you. The other big piece is, are you conventional or are you organic? And this is a, this sort of is a bifurcation point about how you're going to fertilize that whole crop for the, the, you know, for the next few years because of the rules that, are, that are, must be abided by in an organic plan. And they really do affect your fertilizer choices. And one of your biggest choices to make is how actually, how much manure do I want to put down? And uh, I'm just going to keep going and, and putting it on. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting discussion. And then you get into the custom blends. A lot of these dries, you know, MAP, DAP, and your orthophosphate and polyphosphate liquids can be blended together into custom formulations that fit crops, that fit soil types. And this is sort of a, you know, going down the rabbit hole with phosphorus products because every company has their own proprietary blends that have, uh, you know, tricky bits added to make the plants grow. Uh, but the, really the base of it all is, are these simple materials here. And, and that flexibility piece is what gives us the most leverage when we're trying to grow our crops. We can supply phosphorus across a wide variety of application, logistics, 
And so we can meet the, the uh, lettuce demands. Here's Yuma lettuce in December. Uh, this is the market that I personally look after. Uh, if you want to flip this into the summer, this is what Salinas, California looks like. That's where they shoot those Wendy's commercials where there's, she's just wandering out in the, in the field of lettuce. Uh, they didn't shoot that in Yuma for some reason. <laughs> and then we, we do the really expensive, you know, really high value, high margin crops like almonds. And all these different products, the phosphorus use, is, uh, is the key to our, our success every, year over year is, is that flexibility. So what are growers looking for? in their fertilizer choice. One is their crop type. Are they on an annual system, which really typifies most of agriculture across the US, corn, soybeans, wheat, th things like that. But when you get into the western markets and down in Florida, you have more permanent crops, so things like citrus and almonds. Uh, and then you have these sort of semi-permanent crops, things like alfalfa, uh, that are usually in, in ground for three to four years, depending on the stand life. So you start with that crop type. All those crops have different phosphate demands and different phosphate timings that you need to hit uh, in order to grow a good yield and, a, and have good quality. Uh, we start with planning. Helena Chemical, and, and this is my job as an agronomist, uh, is we start with this testing. Where are you at now on your soil test rates? Do we need to build your soil phosphorus? Do we need to apply just an agronomic rate and, and keep match the removal rates? So if you have three tons of almonds coming off, we can actually estimate how much phosphate that's going to remove. Or do we need to just hang out? Uh, you don't need to put as much phosphorus down. You have a lot in your soil. Uh, that last scenario doesn't happen very often in the West. And then finally, you have to choose your, your fertilizer based on growers' application equipment. Are they broadcast, set up for broadcasting dry, uh, band, or are they a liquid where they just do band injections, either in furrow or on a two by two? Uh, on a side dress. I know that sounds like a whole bunch of a, uh, you know, terminology you're not familiar with, and that's okay. Uh, I think I think having some of the industry people here is is really helpful because um, we're right in the middle of that supply chain, and it's a different culture, and, and we have some different needs um, than uh, people on the you know the end of the pipe. So your other concerns with liquid application are, are you fertigating? That just means running your fertilizer through a drip irrigation or overhead in a center pivot or through flood and furrow irrigation? Uh, or are you a dryland application? One of the biggest drivers of fertilizer choice is just local practices. You drive around to enough of these little farm towns, you know, you'll figure out who, oh, we only use dry phosphorus, we only use liquid. Sometimes you ask, well, why? What's the why? Well, there happens to be a rail spur, you know, on the outside of town, so we can get dry fertilizer really easily, whereas the, the folks using liquid maybe have to truck it all in from some sort of storage plant. And folks get comfortable using uh, certain products, and that just becomes the way it is. So one piece that Helen has been doing is uh, we're not promoting phosphorus sustainability using those terms. The terms that I speak in uh, with, with growers is all about dollars per acre. It's all converted. You know, I, if I were to use the term sustainability on the farm, I think they would expect me to pull out a hookah and a hacky sack and <laughs> smell like patchouli or something. I, and I'm being serious with you. Um, sustainability hasn't really made its way, at least maybe into the parts that I work in, California, Arizona. But people are really interested in, in, in saving money on fertilizer, and we distill it down to that economic piece right away. So variable rate technology, you have increased digitization of farm data streams, and you have a whole bunch of people that are comfortable using all the various uh, data software to analyze this stuff. So we're connecting field variability, writing that prescription to solve problems on the field that are field specific, and then we have that application technology. So I put together a, a program uh, for phosphorus blend, uh, for cotton near Phoenix, Arizona. And we're trying to hit those four R's, right source, rate, time, and place. And what we're doing is more increasingly is, is managing these layers. Like I said, every thing on a farm produces data now. Well, how fast the tractor's going, how much gas, you know, diesel it used, how they seeded. And it's all becoming integrated into these software packages where a grower just with an iPad or their phone or myself as an agronomist can look at that entire field history at, at my fingertips 
and, and make the right recommendation for what needs to happen. So here's a, a program I put together. This is variable rate phosphorus, like I said, 10270 for the blend. It's in gallons per acre. And here's the rates. I know it's small. If it's red, that was a high soil P testing spot, so it gets less phosphorus. If it's in blue, that was a low soil P testing area, and it gets uh, a higher rate of phosphorus. So you w might be wondering, why is there this streak going through the field? Well, apparently a while ago, uh, the county put a sewer line under this field, and they backfilled it with sand. Um, so it's it's, you've had this long-lasting effect on the field, and this is 40 years after the fact. So what, what happens when you variable rate phosphorus? Remember, red is, is low, uh, low applied rate of fertilizer. Blue is, is much higher. We, we ran the numbers. We were able to save this grower 12.5% 12 12 um, US dollars on this variable rate program versus a conventional program. We saved 150 gallons of fertilizer. And if you convert that to pounds of, of P205, it's about 460 pounds. So Helen is, con you know, we're, we're, we're working on this tightening up current application strategies to drive some more efficiency in the phosphorus markets. Uh, we're, like I said, we're not using the word sustainability. Um, we are using, we're going to try to save you some money. But it's like sneaky sustainability. <laughs> so I was asked, what are some challenges for recycled products? Uh, I'd say recycled pea is already used in agriculture, manures and compost. If you guys, if some of you in here are, are really hardcore organic people, you should come visit me in the winter. We'll go to an organic field. I'll show you the, uh, the mountain of, of, of cow poop used to grow that spinach, or that, it's probably kale, your kale smoothie. Um, <laughs> we use a ton of it. And, and I, I think people forget that. And, and what we're trying to do is, is we use our soil test information, use our crop information to look at, well, can we back you down on your manure rate? Can we, do we need to increase it? Do we need to switch to another product that doesn't quite cause as many issues as, as over application of manures and compost? Organic or conventional over application of manure is still a problem. In, in the area that I cover, California, Arizona, my main issue isn't eutrophication of waterways from phosphorus, it's pollution of groundwater from nitrate. So if we can back people off manure for the nitrogen, you know, it's a win-win, phosphorus and nitrogen. So one, other issues with manures and compost, the analysis isn't consistent. How many pounds per nutrient are you putting out in a ton? Uh, manures and compost carry E. coli risks. So now with all the food safety laws, you have to be very, very careful about what actually touches that kale so it doesn't get in your smoothie. Uh, and then salinity risks. A ton of compost and manure generally has between 5 and 10 percent by weight uh, sodium and chloride, so you don't want to salt your way into a, a, you know, a situation. Uh, I was asked about struvite, and, and one issue that's come up with struvite is, is I don't hear this talk about what's, what is the price of that pound per P delivered, because that's what's going to come up in a conversation with a grower. Can you match? This manure I have, price delivered, you know, pound P delivered in that manure or that conventional phosphate product. So that's, that's a challenge for recycled products. And then struvite needs to fit existing delivery and application equipment. Can you actually put it out in a tender? Can you move it, you know, through a disc spinner? That sort of thing. So just that on the ground, get your, get your hands dirty. Uh, don't fall in the, the canal or anything. Um, just more, more, I think, field, field work needs to be done before the Struvite products will really be embraced. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Does anyone have a quick question for Carl? We'll let you ruminate on that a little longer. Galen, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm uh, happy to be back again. I think this is the third uh, meeting I've been at. How many of you ever, ever heard of uh, Jared Simplot Company? Okay. One of the things that you may not know about Jared Simplot Company is we're one of McDonald's largest uh, processors of their potato products. So, uh, and actually potatoes require a lot of phosphate. Jared Simplot Company is basic in the manufacturing of uh, phosphorus products. 
uh, phosphate fertilizers, uh, phosphate feedstuffs. We have two mines in the western U.S., uh, one in, uh, on the Idaho-Wyoming border, the other one in northeast Utah. And those two mines uh, give us the ability to uh, process and manufacture phosphate products uh, less than 2% of the world capacity or world needs. So we're a pretty small player, but regionally and in the U.S., we manufacture about 10% of the U.S. Uh, production and uh, supply 15 to 20% of the U.S. needs. So phosphorus is uh, dear to our company. Uh, our phosphate mines are, we're actually mining uh, uh, marine reserves that were laid down uh, eons of time ago. They used to be down in the bottom of the ocean, and now they're up in the top of the mountains at about seven to 8,000 uh, feet elevation. Uh, we have to mine the ore, we crush it, uh, we put it in a slurry and we pump it a hundred miles up and down over the mountains from Afton, Wyoming all the way to uh, Pocatello, Idaho and then also from Vernal, Utah to Rock Springs, Wyoming. There we manufacture uh, high quality phosphate products. In fact, I, th I think this is a pretty interesting diagram of what happens to phosphate ore. I'm sure that uh, many of you are, uh, so there's one process, thermal process. We don't participate in this process of making elemental uh, phosphorus, purified phosphoric acid for um, uh, food uses, but it's always interesting to keep in mind that uh, it's pretty important for the production of Roundup. In fact, Monsanto has a mine where they mine their, uh, their, their phosphorus ore very close to where we're mining at. But we as a company uh, participate in everything to the right of, of this uh, food production right there. In fact, we're producing uh, products like monoammonium phosphate, <coughs> diammonium phosphate, triple superphosphate, diacal for uh, production for uh, feedstuffs for animals. A uh, fellow from Smithfield uh, Foods was talking about. Uh, then we also take these products and we make uh, uh, superphosphoric acid, which uh, APP, ammonium polyphosphate, 11370, uh, 1034 liquid phosphate products, then we can take those and further make other products uh, like uh, starters for uh, different crops. So we participate in manufacturing both liquid and granular phosphate products and Helena would be one of our customers. We also compete with Helena because we, besides having uh, manufacturing we're also invested in uh, retail fertilizer distribution and we have many wholesale customers. Um, we have uh, retail locations in 15 western states. Uh, I work with about 300 uh, crop advisors which would work with customers out in the field just as uh, you were discussing, we go out to the field, we work with those customers, we make recommendations on their farms, and we also uh, use Precision Ag. So I mentioned this is our vernal mine with processing in Rock Springs, Wyoming. This is our Smoky Canyon mine right on the border there that uh, processes in Pocatello, Idaho. We also have import facilities on the Gulf of Mexico, uh, import facilities up here at Portland, and also Lathrop, California. We have a large presence in the West, but we're really an international company, and I think, uh, uh, Donna, you would recognize the name Simplot from Australia also. 
very involved in uh, the Pacific Rim. So we have uh, manufacturing of phosphate products, retail, you know, as you think about, well, how do they get these products out to the field? We have to have a large distribution system. We have to have storage capabilities uh, to protect the fertilizer from the elements. Uh, so we can get it to the farmer. We deliver it in uh, uh, tender trucks to the field. Most all of the equipment now that farmers are using have GPS technology in them. So they go out to the field uh, and a, a piece of equipment like this would be equipped with uh, GPS equipment and with the variable rate technology this type of uh, equipment can actually uh, and the variable yield maps like uh, was discussed earlier this type of equipment can apply variable rates of product in the field including phosphate nitrogen potassium whatever you need and actually has the ability to mix different fertilizer components in the field while it's applying according to a, a GPS uh, variable rate map which has been done on a computer sent to the field on a little uh, memory card put into the machine and the machine does the, the rest. We are really using space age technology to be able to deliver nutrients to the field and apply them very precisely. But one of the, this morning there was a discussion about the Olson method being uh, kind of an old technology. Um, probably our biggest limitation, in my opinion as an agronomist, is the ability to understand the spatial variability of phosphorus and other nutrients in the soil in the field. We got, how many here have ever taken a soil sample, that your garden, your lawn, or a, a field uh, to understand nutrients? Okay? We go out and we gather this sample and we feel really good about it and it fits in about the palm of your hand. We deliver it to the lab and they can very precisely tell us how much nutrients is in that sample then we can make a recommendation based on that that sample that fits in the palm of my hand but that recommendation is only as good as that sample represents 40 acres 80 acres 160 acres and so uh, in my opinion understanding spatial variability in the field of phosphorus and other nutrients is probably uh, one of my biggest hang-ups. So with that, we'll, I'll pass the time back to Tom. Okay. Any quick questions for Galen before he sits down? Okay, we'll go oh. on. Sorry? How precise is your application? Like a, a plus or minus, a, a pound to the acre, half pound? I would say we're within plus or minus 25 pounds per acre, but we can variable rate uh, applications as low as 25 pounds and as high as, you know, uh, 1,000 pounds per acre. So we have a lot of variability. Usually uh, when we're doing these uh, zone maps, we are limit ourselves to the number of zones, maybe five zones in a field, five, six zones. So we really are more limited by the amount of zones that we can cut that map up into. And then, then you have to remember the equipment's running across the field at five, six, ten miles per acre, but it's constantly changing and remixing and understanding where it's at and what needs to be applied in that area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Galen. I'll now ask uh, Chris if you ought to come to the stage. Ah, thank you. I'll get to my slides here. I think it's advanced. There's probably any other 
You're going the wrong way. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. All right, thanks. You're the right. There you go. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Chris Piott. I am a process engineer at the Blue Plains Advanced Water Resource Recovery Facility in DC. Big giant facility you can see. Here's a overhead shot of our facility. Um, my title is Director of Resource Recovery. And my main job is to try and find a home for all of the treated human manure that comes out of DC. You can insert your joke about Congress right here, because everybody does. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Everybody else does. Um, it's a big plant. We're the largest, world's largest advanced wastewater treatment plant. Everybody loves their superlatives. There are other plants that treat more water, but nobody treats it to the same standard that we do. Um, I love this because you can see here, is there a pointer? Yeah. That's our effluent, and it looks like a dark spot, but it's actually clear. It's the clearest spot on the Potomac River. And what we do is, five miles upstream in this muddy river, we take water out. It gets treated to drinking water standards, goes down to the citizens of DC. I'm one of those. We use it. My family uses it. We add a little bit to it. We, it goes down through the sewer system. We put it down here. And when it hits the plant, in 22 hours, we send water out that's way cleaner than the river itself. And our prime objective is to keep pollutants, in air quotes, out of the uh, Chesapeake Bay. And uh, in our case, the pollutants are nutrients, uh, phosphorus and, uh, included. Um, we don't even refer to ourselves as a wastewater treatment plant anymore, but rather as a resource recovery facility. Recovering water, of course, the world's most precious commodity, but also uh, nutrients, carbon, and energy. Carbon and energy are often lumped together, but I like to separate them because, I, personally, I don't think it's terribly sustainable to turn all that carbon into energy. So we now have digesters where we convert about half of that organic matter into methane, burn it, make renewable energy, and then the other half gets returned to the earth from which it came, uh, which is good. Um, we have. Uh, for a long time had a land application program on farms, we have silviculture sites, we do mine reclamation, and we've been recently doing some urban restoration work with the biosolids. And two years ago we started up the digesters and we are now making green energy. I, I love this, I don't know if you can read this up here, but this is our connection to the ratepayers so that they understand and they make a contribution to our system, it helps us make green energy, it's power from, power from the people. Um, but I really feel like we have this great sustainable program uh, to recover the nutrients, make green energy. Um, agriculture has always been the backbone of the program. This is one of our beautiful farms in Fauquier County, Virginia. You can see which side of the fence there got uh, biosolids and which side did not. Um, so what we do is we keep nutrients, but it, you know, we're talking about phosphorus here, to keep phosphorus out of sensitive waters. Uh, annually, there are 9.1 million dry tons of biosolids generated in the U.S., and the phosphorus levels in those biosolids can be anywhere between 1 and 6 percent. So that means there's roughly 350,000 tons of phosphorus that are generated out of wastewater treatment plants. It's a rough estimate, but it's a large amount. The crime of it is half of that gets landfilled, because half the biosolids in the U.S. just get landfilled because it's easy. <laughs> um, but that also locks up all the carbon and all the other nutrients in there as well. Uh, and there are a lot, of, a lot of benefits other than the uh, phosphorus that's, you know, they're slow release nutrients that come out of the biosolids when they go onto agricultural land. Um, enormous carbon footprint reduction uh, through this graph here. It um, just shows the uh, effect of the avoidance of inorganic fertilizers, because it takes energy to make these ammonium nitrate. The, the actual physical sequestration of carbon in the soil. So um, it's, it's helping our carbon footprint and carbon footprint of farms. And there's also these properties that the biosolids have. I'm not going to go into it. If anybody wants to talk to me about it, I'll talk your ear off about the fact that when you, we land apply these biosolids with these rich microbial uh, dense populations that it helps the crops resist drought so they can get through drought conditions better. They don't need as much water. Again, I could go down that rabbit hole and talk forever, but we'll, we'll move on. So our prime directive is to keep nutrients out of sensitive uh, re receiving waters. Unfortunately for you guys, our prime directive is not to sustainably recover the phosphorus and reuse it 
well. <laughs> it is to try and keep it out of these receiving waters. And there's uh, phosphorus is removed at wastewater treatment plants um, through chemical, biological, and physical processes, and there are issues related to each of them. Chemical addition, what we do at Blue Plains is add ferric chloride, it's an iron salt, it binds the phosphorus in the biosolids, and it does not end up in our effluent, which is great. So then it ends up on the farmer's field and it's bound there. That's not great. Uh, biological P can be re-released in, in the digestion process. That's not great. It just loops back to the front of the plant. And uh, struvite removal, uh, I, this is a wild oversimplification. I was talking to Matt from Ostere about that, this this morning. But it sort of is difficult to meet stringent effluent standards economically. There's more to the story there. But um, some problems with that at our plant, just sort of because of the legacy of the technologies that we have. So we're an enormous plant, um, 290 million gallons a day. We use iron salts for pea removal, and it's bound in the biosolids. Uh, since we have had our phosphorus limits reduced, um, in 1985 we were allowed to uh, discharge 9 million pounds out into the bay, and now it's down to 3. That represents a 67% reduction of the um, pounds of phosphorus that go to the bay, so it was an enormous improvement. Um, the overall phosphorus pollution that is attributed to wastewater treatment dropped by about 30, 35% in that same period, or from 35 to 17% in that same period. Um, our limit is extremely low. It's 0.18 milligrams per liter in that discharge. 300 million gallons a day going out has to be 0.18 milligrams per liter. Our phosphorus is about 6.5% on a dry weight basis, and we have an enormous Iron content, which means our water extractable phosphorus is very low. It's only 4% of the total P. Um, state regulations vary. Um, many of the states treat all the phosphorus equally, assuming that it's all available and extractable. Um, two examples locally, Pennsylvania and Maryland, allow use of the water extractable phosphorus uh, test to determine a site-specific phosphorus index. Wisconsin actually calls out in its biosolids regulations um, that treatment plants that use uh, iron salts, such as iron and aluminum, um, actually bind the, the phosphorus. So they, are, they allow for a higher application rate of biosolids. Again, it's not super sustainable because um, it's bound <laughs> up there. If you look at water extractable phosphorus uh, for triple superphosphate, dairy and poultry manures, and aerobic and anaerobically digested biosolids. You can see it's dramatically lower, which is good for us, because that means it's not ending up in the Chesapeake Bay. Not great for sustainable use of, of phosphorus. Uh, and this is just another graph showing the relationship between percent of P that is water extractable and the total amount of uh, iron or metal salts that are in there. Uh, these are all Biosolids products, these are manures that don't have the addition of the metal salts. Again, great for us because we're keeping it out of the bay, not so great for sustainable pea use. So in summary, there are considerable quantities of phosphorus that are generated in biosolids. I would consider that a uh, sustainable source. It's not coming out of a mine somewhere. Um, half of that ends up in the landfill. That's not great. It's something that we need to work on as an industry. Uh, much of the other half is bound in the land applied biosolids. Uh, again, great for us because it's staying out of the receiving waters, not so great for phosphorus use. Um, discharge permit limits and economics drive the decisions at wastewater treatment plants. We are also inherently a very conservative industry. If anybody's worked with the wastewater industry, you know we don't like change. We, don't, we like things that work. We use 100 year old technology because it works. Uh, largely because we're judged based on our discharge permit limits, and we're all, we all high-five each other if we've gained platinum status, which means we've gone a certain number of years without having a discharge permit limit. If we do have a violation, there are huge fines. In our case, it's something like $78,000 a day until we fix it. And if they f do an investigation and they find out that there is some negligence, uh, it's a felony, and whoever signs the permit can go to jail. So, extremely conservative industry, uh, sort of averse to change. Um, our current low uh, phosphorus permit limits 
favor economical solutions to keeping uh, pee out of the sensitive waterways um, and ones that have been done elsewhere. Um, so I, you know, my message here is that we need to be innovative. Uh, we need an innovative and economical solution to phosphorus recovery at plants with low discharge limits. Um, Matt and I were talking about a way that we could possibly do it. Is that me? <laughs> I think that's time. <laughs> uh, luckily, as my last slide, we can open it up to discussion if we have time. Thank you, Chris. That, I think, was fortunately the last slide. Yes. So um, um, we're now ready to open up for questions. Yes. you do at uh, BC Water. Oh good, are you using the product? We are in fact, yes. Um, so I was just going to ask a question about, uh, given your experience in the industry, have you seen the public perception uh, side of things shift in terms of use of those final products? We have. I, uh, I've been doing this a long time and uh, I've been through a lot of very fiery discussions and public meetings having to do with the use of human manure. We're all pre-programmed and hardwired to be afraid of our own waste. And that fear is triggered by the odors and even if we treat the biosolids to the extent that there are no uh, pathogens in it anymore, there can still be an odor there that triggers that fear. And we've, we've do a lot of research looking at um, some of the pollutants of persistent persistent pollutants of concern and um, we have questions to a lot of the answer or we have answers to a lot of the questions that people have um, but what I what I found is that at least in DC there's a really really strong urban uh, ag community and they get what we're trying to do they understand the science they understand that this is sustainable and it's locally sourced which is really sort of hot right now too having locally sourced things um, we rolled out our product, which we've, we've branded as Bloom, Bloom Biosolids uh, Soil Amendment, into DC, and I was warning my staff, I said, wear your flak jackets to these public meetings, you're gonna get, you're gonna get flaming arrows shot at you, people are gonna be very concerned about this. And we, we've not had one complaint about it, maybe it's because we're prepared for the questions, but I really do think that people are starting to understand the sustainability issue, uh, the carbon issue, the, the importance of, re, of sequestering that carbon uh, back to the land. Um, occasionally out in rural Virginia, we will come across somebody who has some concerns and we were very, very adamant about having strong public outreach and we answer all the questions and that. oftentimes people just want to be heard and if they get an answer, they're, they're satisfied. So, Long answer, the short answer is I think that there is, uh, the perception is changing. Yep. I've had growers out west embrace biosolids as well, uh, mostly on forage crops. So huge 100 acre center pivots full of biosolids. It's an interesting day. Mm -hmm. yes. so I have a quick question for each of the panelists and I'll go in reverse order since I've got the last one the freshest in my mind. Sure. So the three million pounds of uh, pea discharged annually. So is that total phosphorus, orthophosphate? It's total P. Okay, because then in terms of uh, nutrient mining as fertilizer, at P205, it's about 19% of that number, right? Uh, I'll take or, your word for it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so, so that was the nature of my question, the, the speciation of, yes. the, of the discharge. Uh, for gallon? Yes. So does Simplot get further down in the potato production end into like uh, finished products uh, like frozen french fries? Or exactly, whatever? that's what we produce for yeah. McDonald's and many other uh, uh, quick uh, restaurant uh, groups. So yeah, we, we pro uh, process potatoes in not only the U.S. and Canada but also uh, Australia uh, New Zealand and mainland China, and starting up in Argentina. So you, you, you're through the whole chain there, from fertilizer exactly. at the front end to finished product on the supermarket shelf. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, last question. So the slideshow with the lettuce uh -huh. uh, makes me think to ask the question, if you could come up with a custom blend 
NPK formulation for lettuce growing? Would it be something like a 3.33? No, lettuce is, is particularly uh, heavy phosphate demand. Okay. Uh, also, we're growing it when it's cold. Um, if you ever need a Christmas vacation, come to Yuma and see fields of lettuce growing on December 25th. Uh, it's quite the sight. But so we use a lot heavier of a mix. Um, really, a lot of phosphorus will go into that product. Usually, a dry blend like MAP. Um, but we do supplement with something that's a low analysis, pretty even through the season, like a 333 or something like that. And it's a very short-term crop. It's a very short-term crop, so you've got to really drive it to get your market size and get your quality. Okay. We have time for just one last quick question. Yeah, uh, yeah, hi, I'm Matt, <coughs> excuse me, Kuzma with Ostara, and, and I just wanted to build a little bit on Chris's um, comment, which Chesapeake has a long history of nutrient issues and they have a lot of legacy infrastructure that was built to address that over time and modifying and adapting. They would never build what they have today if they started with a clean sheet of paper. And, and Chris, maybe, well, if we have time, you can comment as well. Chris Hornback, I'm sorry, over here, because um, recently some very different things happened in Chicago. And um, it hasn't really been mentioned, but Chicago was identified as the largest cause of Gulf of Mexico dead zones, and they were sued by NRDC and lots of other environmental groups to address that issue. And they took a completely different approach to solving the challenge, which is instead of fighting it through legal and lots of other means on trying to address very specific discharge limits, as Chris said, his discharge limit is 0 0.18. And so you get into lots of debates over what does that number have to be. They actually settled that suit and accepted a limit ahead, so they accelerated their compliance date in exchange for some other accommodations on how the limit was applied. And they've been able to meet um, below 0.5 and now below 0.3 completely biologically with no chemical addition and their largest nutrient recovery facility in the world now. It's been operating a year, about 10,000 tons a day, or a year of production capacity. And so, a bit of it comes into some of the permit applications and how that applies. And um, how that applies can open up a much broader spectrum, both ag and municipally, in terms of wastewater, how that applies. I will also say that to the perception question that DC Water is well ahead of the curve, their leadership, Chris, George Hawkins, and others, where you are, is, a, is an unusual example of forward thinking leadership in the industry. I'd love to have more of them out there. Unfortunately, they're in, in limited supply. So just to give them some kudos here when you're giving them some business. Thanks for that point. I, I didn't really hear a question in there, did I? No. Okay, very good. Join me in thanking these three guys for...